Chapter 14 Distinctness and Precision of Utterance In man speaks God, Hesiod, words and days, and endless are the modes of speech, and far extends from side to side the field of words. Homer, Iliad In popular usage the terms pronunciation, enunciation, and articulation are synonymous, but real pronunciation includes three distinct processes, and may therefore be defined as the utterance of a syllable or a group of syllables with regard to articulation, accentuation, and enunciation. Distinct and precise utterance is one of the most important considerations of public speech. How preposterous it is to hear a speaker making sounds of inarticulate earnestness under the contented delusion that he is telling something to his audience. Telling? Telling means communicating and how can he actually communicate without making every word distinct? Slovenly pronunciation results from either physical deformity or habit. A surgeon or a surgeon dentist may correct a deformity, but your own will, working by self-observation and resolution in drill, will break a habit. All depends upon whether you think it worthwhile. Defective speech is so widespread that freedom from it is the exception. It is painfully common to hear public speakers mutilate the king's English. If they do not actually murder it, as Curran once said, they often knock an eye out. A Canadian clergyman, writing in the homiletic review, relates that in his student days a classmate who was an Englishman supplied a country church for a Sunday. On the following Monday he conducted a missionary meeting. In the course of his address he said some farmers thought they were doing their duty toward missions when they gave their hods and hens to the work, but the Lord required more. At the close of the meeting a young woman seriously said to a friend, I am sure the farmers do well if they give their hogs and hens to missions. It is more than most people can afford. It is insufferable effrontery for any man to appear before an audience who persists in driving the H out of happiness, home and heaven, and, to paraphrase Waldo Messaros, will not let it rest in hell. He who does not show enough self-knowledge to see in himself such glaring faults, nor enough self-mastery to correct them has no business to instruct others. If he can do no better, he should be silent. If he will do no better, he should also be silent. Barring incurable physical defects and few are incurable nowadays the whole matter is one of will. The catalogue of those who have done the impossible by faithful work is as inspiring as a roll call of warriors. The less there is of you, says Nathan Shepard, the more need for you to make the most of what there is of you. Articulation. Articulation is the forming and joining of the elementary sounds of speech. It seems an appalling task to utter articulately the third of a million words that go to make up our English vocabulary. But the way to make a beginning is really simple, learn to utter correctly, and with easy change from one to the other, each of the 44 elementary sounds in our language. The reasons why articulation is so painfully slurred by a great many public speakers are for ignorance of the elemental sounds, failure to discriminate between sounds nearly alike, a slovenly, lazy use of the vocal organs, and a torpid will. Anyone who is still master of himself will know how to handle each of these defects. The vowel sounds are the most vexing source of errors especially where diphthongs are found. Who has not heard such errors as are hit off in this inimitable verse by Oliver Wendell Holmes? Learning condemns beyond the reach of hope. The careless lips that speak of so ap for so ap, her edict exiles from her fair abode. The clownish voice that utters our ad for our ad, less stern to him who calls his co at, a co at, and steers his bo at believing it to be o at. She pardon one. Our classic cities boast, who said at Cambridge, M.O.S.T. instead of M.O. Street, but knit her brows and stamped her angry foot. To hear a teacher call O.R.O.R.T. O.R.O.R.T. The foregoing examples are all monosyllables, but bad articulation is frequently the result of joining sounds that do not belong together. For example, no one finds it difficult to say beauty, but many persist in pronouncing duty as though it were spelled either duty or duty. It is not only from untaught speakers that we hear such slovenly articulations as column for column, and pretty for pretty, but even great orators occasionally offend quite as unblushingly as less noted mortals. Nearly all such are errors of carelessness, 
not of pure ignorance if carelessness because the ear never tries to hear what the lips articulate. It must be exasperating to a foreigner to find that the elemental sound you gives him no hint for the pronunciation of bow, cough, rough, thorough, and through, and we can well forgive even a man of culture who occasionally loses his way amidst the intricacies of English articulation but there can be no excuse for the slovenly utterance of the simple vowel sounds which form at once the life and the beauty of our language. He who is too lazy to speak distinctly should hold his tongue. The consonant sounds occasion serious trouble only for those who do not look with care at the spelling of words about to be pronounced. Nothing but carelessness can account for saying Jacob, Baptist, Sevim, Alwis, or Sadisfi. He that hath yours to your, let him your is the rendering which an anglophobiac clergyman gave of the familiar scripture, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. After hearing the name of Sir Humphrey Davy pronounced, a Frenchman who wished to write to the eminent Englishman thus addressed the letter, Serum Fry Davy. Accentuation. Accentuation is the stressing of the proper syllables in words. This it is that is popularly called pronunciation. For instance, we properly say that a word is mispronounced when it is accented invite instead of invite, though it is really an offense against only one form of pronunciation accentuation. It is the work of a lifetime to learn the accents of a large vocabulary and to keep pace with changing usage, but an alert ear, the study of word origins, and the dictionary habit, will prove to be mighty helpers in a task that can never be finally completed. Enunciation. Correct enunciation is the complete utterance of all the sounds of a syllable or a word. Wrong articulation gives the wrong sound to the vowel or vowels of a word or a syllable, as do for do, or unites two sounds improperly, as holy for holy. Wrong enunciation is there. Incomplete utterance of a syllable or a word, the sound omitted or added being usually consonantal. To say necessity instead of necessity is a wrong articulation. To say doin for doing is improper enunciation. The one articulates that is, joints two sounds that should not be joined, and thus gives the word a positively wrong sound, the other fails to touch all the sounds in the word, and in that particular way also sounds the word incorrectly. My text may be found in the fifth and sixth verses of the second chapter of Titus, and the subject of my discourse is the government of our homes. 6. What did this preacher do with his final consonants? This slovenly dropping of essential sounds is as offensive as the common habit of running words together so that they lose their individuality and distinctness. Light and dark, up and down, don't you know, particular, zamination, are all too common to need comment. Imperfect enunciation is due to lack of attention and to lazy lips. It can be corrected by resolutely attending to the formation of syllables as they are uttered. Flexible lips will enunciate difficult combinations of sounds without slighting any of them, but such flexibility cannot be attained except by habitually uttering words with distinctness and accuracy. A daily exercise in enunciating a series of sounds will in a short time give flexibility to the lips and alertness to the mind, so that no word will be uttered without receiving its due complement of sound. Returning to our definition, we see that when the sounds of a word are properly articulated, the right syllables accented, and full value given to each sound in its enunciation, we have correct pronunciation. Perhaps one word of caution is needed here, lest anyone, anxious to bring out clearly every sound, should overdo the matter and neglect the unity and smoothness of pronunciation. Be careful not to bring syllables into so much prominence as to make words seem long and angular. The joints must be kept decently dressed before delivery. Do not fail to go over your manuscript and note every sound that may possibly be mispronounced. Consult the dictionary and make assurance doubly sure. If the arrangement of words is unfavorable to clear enunciation, change either words or order and do not rest until you can follow Hamlet's directions to the players. Questions and Exercises 1. Practice repeating the following rapidly, paying particular attention to the consonants. Foolish Flavius flushing feverishly, fiercely found fault with, Flora's frivolity, 
7. Mary's matchless mimicry makes much mischief. Seated on shining shale she sells seashells. You youngsters yielded your youthful yuletide yearnings. Yesterday, too, sounds the L in each of the following words, repeated in sequence, blue black blinkers blocked black blondin's eyes. 3. Do you say a blue sky or a blue sky? 4. Compare the U sound in few and in new. Say each aloud, and decide which is correct. New York, New York, or New York. 5. Pay careful heed to the directions of this chapter in reading the following, from Hamlet. After the interview with the ghost of his father, Hamlet tells his friends Horatio and Marcellus that he intends to act a part, Horatio, O oh day and night, but this is wondrous strange, Hamlet, and therefore as a stranger give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio than are dreamt of in your philosophy. But come, here, as before, never, so help you mercy. How strange or odd so are I bear myself, comma, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet, to put an antic disposition on, comma, that you, at such times seeing me, never shall, with arms encumbered thus, or this head shake, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase, as well, well, we know, or we could and if we would, or if we list to speak, or the be, and if the might, or such ambiguous giving out, to note, that you know aught of me, this not to do, so grace and mercy at your most need help you, swear, act 1. Scene 5, 6. Make a list of common errors of pronunciation, saying which are due to faulty articulation, wrong accentuation and incomplete enunciation. In each case make the correction. 7. Criticize any speech you may have heard which displayed these faults. 8. Explain how the false shame of seeming to be too precise may hinder us from cultivating perfect verbal utterance. 9. Over precision is likewise a fault. To bring out any syllable unduly is to caricature your word. Be moderate in reading the following. The last speech of Maximilian de Robespierre. The enemies of the Republic call me tyrant. Were I such they would grovel at my feet. I should gorge them with gold. I should grant them immunity for their crimes, and they would be grateful. Were I such, the kings we have vanquished, far from denouncing Robespierre, would lend me their guilty support. There would be a covenant between them and me. Tyranny must have tools. But the enemies of tyranny, comma, whither does their path tend to the tomb and to immortality? What tyrant is my protector? To what faction do I belong? Yourselves. What faction, since the beginning of the revolution, has crushed and annihilated so many detected traitors? You, the people, comma, our principles are that faction, a faction to which I am devoted and against which all the scoundrelism of the day is banded. The confirmation of the Republic has been my object, and I know that the Republic can be established only on the eternal basis of morality. Against me, and against those who hold kindred principles, the League is formed. My life, oh! My life I abandon without a regret. I have seen the past and I foresee their future. What friend of this country would wish to survive their moment when he could no longer serve it, comma, when he could no longer defend innocence against oppression? Wherefore should I continue in an order of things, where intrigue eternally triumphs over truth, where justice is mocked, where passions their most abject, or fears the most absurd? override the sacred interests of humanity in witnessing the multitude of vices which the torrent of the revolution has rolled in turbid communion with its civic virtues, I confess that I have sometimes feared that I should be sullied, in the eyes of posterity, by the impure neighborhood of unprincipled men, who had thrust themselves into association with the sincere friends of humanity, and I rejoice that these conspirators against my country have now, by their reckless rage, traced deep the line of demarcation between themselves and all true men. Question history, and learn how all the defenders of liberty, in all times, have been overwhelmed by calumny, but their traducers died also. The good and the bad disappear alike from the earth, but in very different conditions. O oh Frenchman, O oh my countrymen, let not your enemies, with their desolating doctrines, 
degrade, your souls, and enervate your virtues. No, Chomit, no, death, is not an eternal sleep, citizens. Efface from the tomb that, motto, graven by sacrilegious hands, which spreads over all, nature of funereal crape, takes from oppressed innocence its, support, and affronts the beneficent dispensation of death, inscribe rather thereon these words, death is the commencement, of immortality, I leave to the oppressors of the people a, terrible testament, which I proclaim with the independence, befitting one whose career is so nearly ended, it is the awful, truth thou shalt die, footnotes, footnote 6, school and college speaker, Mitchell, footnote 7, school and college speaker, Mitchell.